there ec family and friends my name is tafik and welcome to another faith-filled experience with extraordinary church we are so happy that you're tuning in today's service today is going to be an extra special day just because we're having communion right after service also if you are a first second or third time guest we want to connect with you. There is a guest card that we'd love for you to complete just because we're just trying to get to know you a bit better. And there are multiple ways that you can connect with the EC family. We have our website, we're on various social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, you name it, we're on it. So you can feel free to reach out and to just check us out. And extraordinary generosity is something that we value dearly. The Lord really does love a cheerful giver. And you can feel free to choose a medium that is most convenient to you and that is totally confidential. You can feel free to choose one to your delight and we appreciate your efforts and your generosity to the EC family. Today is gonna to be awesome. I'm excited and I think you should just run into the kitchen, grab your grape juice, your crackers, your bread, whatever it may be, but you're gonna need that for our communion for today. And grab your notepad while you're at it, your tea, your juice, whatever it is, but we're gonna have an amazing time in the Lord and we want you to get ready. Thank you so much and stay tuned for a blessed service.
love you. You are enthroned above the heavens, the earth and all creation. strength and glory the angels crying holy all surround you forever you will stay your kingdom has no end oh holy God I say amazed you are so Praise the Lord. Oh, let's worship him. Come on, in the beauty of holiness, let's magnify his name. You alone are great, Jesus, and you are greatly to be praised. There is none like you. I celebrate what I feel in this place. I feel the presence of Jesus Christ. He is alive and well, and I'm thankful for what I feel today. Come on, AC family, lift him up with me. Let us bless his holy name. Praise God. My name is Pastor Akil Thompson, and I want to welcome you to Extraordinary Church. We believe 
we are the perfect church for imperfect people. As you can tell, I'm rocking some EC wear, no perfect people allowed. And actually what I wanted to do originally when I envisioned this is I was gonna join some of you all, many of you perhaps, where you are. We actually, as you notice, we did our recording for our worship set outside. Well, I was gonna join you outside, but the son just didn't wanna cooperate. <laughs> But I am comfortably dressed and we're gonna have a great time and I trust that you too are comfortably dressed. I want to invite you to join us afterwards. I'd love for you to join us for a time of prayer and connection. Again, it's already been mentioned, uh, we're gonna receive communion today, the Lord's Supper, and I feel the presence of the Lord so strong already. We're gonna have a great time in doing so. So if you haven't yet done so, make sure you have your communion elements with you because as we wrap up the message, we're gonna transition right to our communion. <sighs> this pastor's heart is heavy this week, and it's been this way for quite some time. Our world is dealing with so many things. We're dealing with COVID-19, and there is a lot of social unrest in North America, specifically the United States of America, which is my homeland, and then uh, here in Canada, specifically even Toronto. And those, and due to the influence that we have in the United States of America and in Canada, the entire world is being affected right now. And I wanna speak about uh, just that. I wanna to speak to that. And it's by the help of the Holy Ghost that I wanna share something with you. So I wanna invite you to open up your Bibles to Isaiah chapter one, verse 17 and 18. This is a life passage for me, in particular verse 18, and I'll explain to you why in just a few moments, but I'm excited to be able to share that with you. So open up your Bible, your Bible apps, uh, get ready. And uh, if you're ready, type ready, or give us a thumbs up, an emoji, a smile, something, a smiley face. Let us know you are ready. Isaiah 1 and 17. Learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, Plead the widow's cause. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. And by the help of the Holy Ghost, I wanna preach a very simple thought to you today and really have more like a, a conversation with you. And hopefully it'll be a series of conversations that will be the overflow of what we talk about today. I wanna to talk to you about this. Let us reason together. Let us reason together. Righteous leadership always involves fair treatment of the weakest members of society, orphans, widows, immigrants, and in North America, people of color, and specifically black people. I can remember early on in my ministry, God called me to bring the races together. This work of racial, uh, racial reconciliation began in my heart, really in the infancy of my ministry. I've been blessed uh, to have traveled all over uh, the world to a large degree. I've been to every state in the United States of America with the exception of Alaska. I've been obviously to Canada, we live here, Mexico, the Caribbean, Europe, Africa, uh, and should the Lord tarry, uh, let me put emphasis on that, should he tarry and it be his bidding, then I'll have the opportunity to travel uh, more. And frankly, for a lot of those reasons, my travel have been ministry and I give God praise for that. Uh, though what I quickly found out as I was having racial reconciliatory conversations, if you will, uh, that a lot of uh, my white friends uh, were naive uh, to what perhaps I would experience on a regular basis. They were frankly shocked in some cases, even my wife, uh, which we just celebrated again, 20 years of marriage. I'm thankful. And for those who don't know, Sarah, my wife is white. Obviously, if you're a part of the EC family, then you already know that. But for some of you who perhaps might be a friend, uh, you might think, who is that girl that can sing like that? Man, that girl is singing. That's my wife. Oh, not the one who sang today. Wait, did Sarah sing? <laughs> <laughs> Not the one, uh, yes, she sang today. 
Praise God. We do, we do these recordings and stuff like that. So I was trying to get in my mind who, what worship set are we playing? <laughs> I don't want y'all to think the brown girl, uh, Etana. Obviously, she's, Etana's doing a great job, by the way. So anyway, let me get back on, on track here. <laughs> uh, they were naive to the injustices that people of color, and specifically black men and women, would experience. Here's what I know. Racism is sin. Nobody following Jesus Christ would dispute that. Now, I do think perhaps we don't understand uh, that there are distinct differences between overt racism and covert racism. I'll talk about that here in just a moment. Uh, but it is a sin. And while the world will grow worse, it is our responsibility as the church to shine bright in its day of darkness. Systemic racism has gone unchecked for hundreds of years. And I believe we can shape and affect this generation today. We're not afraid of this. We, we aren't afraid to speak out. We aren't afraid to be involved in the community. As a matter of fact, we've come to shape this day. And if you believe that, you need to say amen. We've come to shape this day in conversations in our homes. We've come to shape this day how we serve those who are now widows. We've come to shape this day by feeding people who need encouragement and hope and are part of the vulnerable community or maybe they've lost their job. We've come to shape this day by sharing the love of Jesus Christ. And if we're going to disciple a generation, reconciliation is a part of that process. I want you to understand that discipleship and reconciliation are together. They are not separate. Jesus broke down one cultural barrier after another. And then guess what? He commissioned us to do the same. And so I'm praying and I'm asking God, I'm asking God to do it in Canada. I'm asking God to do it in my homeland. Let us come to repentance because if the church, if the people who are called by my name will humble themselves and repent, if we'll repent, I'm praying for healing to flow. I'm praying for revival to flow because racial reconciliation is not political work. It's gospel work. Can I tell you, you can't legislate racism away. You won't be able to legislate division away. We need a move of God. We need a work of God. We need God to move in our lives. And why is it a gospel work? Because we are ministers of the gospel. You and I are ministers of the gospel. And what happened to George Floyd? What happened to Breonna Taylor? I'm sorry. What happened to Ahmaud Arbery, Botham Jean, and Trayvon Martin, and others is wrong. I, I, <laughs> I told myself, don't get all emotional. But the reason why I get emotional because I look just like them. <sighs> These are difficult conversations that need to happen. And the scripture invites us to reason together. I want you to check this out. The Hebrew verb carries here the sense to argue or to prove in a legal context. When he says, when the Lord is saying, let us come reason together, the Hebrew verb carries the, uh, here, the sense of, uh, to argue or to prove in a legal context. It does not carry the sense of rational logic implied by the English reason. And what I want to do today is invite us all to come to a place where we'll be willing to reason with scripture and let God begin to speak to us and let God begin to deal with us. See, the Bible constantly focuses on justice. And if you don't think so, then you err egregious, egregiously all throughout the Old and the New Testament. However, unlike the gods, like the lowercase g of other ancient Near Eastern cultures of that time, the God of the Old Testament, he exhibits deep concern for human beings uh, and the issues that they face. I'm thankful that the God that you and I serve is a God who is a personal being. He is interested in justice and often referred to as just, and he is righteous. If you're thankful to serve a just and a righteous God, why don't you just lift your hands right where you are and just simply say, thank you, Jesus. You're amazing and you deserve my praise. God's concern for humanity and justice manifests itself in several ways. Notice when Cain kills Abel. 
Guess what? And I want to move quickly because I want to get to communion, but I don't want to cheapen this moment. I want to put some things in your spirit. So stick with me here. When Cain kills Abel, God exiles him and marks him. And while that passage uh, can be interpreted as exhibiting God's compassion, and I would agree with that conclusion and interpretation, it also presents a strong focus on God's justice. While Cain isn't killed, he is punished for murdering his brother. God is a just God. The laws in the Old Testament emphasize justice, okay, uh, and retribution to a degree. If someone takes an eye, then guess what? An eye must be taken from the offender as retribution, as an equal and opposite reaction to the perpetrator's action. Okay, the reason by that, though, what we sometimes miss is God was trying to limit bloodshed. Let me explain why it required that the punishment of a crime not exceed the crime itself. Whew, I need you to hear me avoiding further damage to the community. I need you to hear me. It required that the punishment of a crime not exceed the crime itself, avoiding further damage to the community. That man, George Floyd, did not deserve to lose his life. Okay, it was a $20 bill. It was a $20 fraudulent bill. And whether or not he produced it or had in his mind he knew it was fraudulent and he was going to distribute it, it did not deserve death. It did not deserve to be humiliated, humiliated in front of other people with that man's knee in his neck, preventing him from being able to breathe and calling on his mom, which is sacred in our community, dying in front of others. It did not warrant that. And thus, it, we could have, we could have avoided further damage to the community, but this has been senseless acts of this for many, many years. And while self-control is the result from this and what God was trying to impart to people, what we need to understand is, uh, when action causes harm to others, punishment must be exacted upon the wrongdoer. Major old portions of the Old Testament illustrate how God's people break covenant, uh, undergo punishment, and repent for their sins, and, and receive forgiveness and restoration for their sins. And I'm thankful for that, not only on an individual level, but on a communal level. God's righteousness requires that there be repercussions for disobedience. In 2 Samuel 2, uh, chapter 12, you remember when the prophet goes to David, he said, David, let me tell you a story. Uh, he tells him of, of this story, like it's real life happening. And he tells him, and David's a shepherd, and David is like, uh, what happened to the sheep? And why would this man do this? And David is incensed, and he's angry, and he said, you know what, prophet? Find me this man. I'm going to take care of it. I'm going to handle it. As a matter of fact, I'm so angry right now, I can kill him. That's what David says. And do you realize the prophet looks at David and says, you are the man. What was he telling him? David, you did this. You took what didn't belong to you. You then on top of that, sent that woman Bathsheba, sent out her husband and you had him murdered. You assassinated this man. And you know what? David was broken. David was, he was convicted. He said, where, how did I get to this place? God help me. I have sinned against you. Justice was required and he paid a steep price. Even throughout the New Testament, Justice is clear, but it deals with, hear me, deals with an attitude and an inner transformation that moves beyond an individual or community's action or inaction. God, this is why Jesus, God, God in the flesh, Jesus, this is who he is, God, God in the flesh. He begins to deal with it in ways. But you know what? I want to share a few stories with you. And, and today I'll probably be a little longer than I normally would. Um, but I grew up in a neighborhood where blacks weren't allowed to be members at a golf club, uh, to play golf. Uh, they were only allowed to work in the kitchen. Uh, we didn't live in that community very long. We lived there for probably five years. I was young, so I would say six to 11. Uh, but I can remember uh, uh, experiencing different types of overt racism uh, because of being black in a predominantly white neighborhood. I later, we moved from there, and I can remember as a teenager, we went to, uh, I love to ride bikes, uh, still do, and we went for a bike ride, a buddy of mine and I, uh, and uh, what's so interesting is, 
he didn't mind that I was black and I didn't care that he was white. I've always tried to get along with everybody. I love people, love connecting with people. And I celebrate the fact that EC, everybody is welcome. Praise God. If you're black, white, red, yellow, makes no difference to us. Everybody is welcome at EC. If you're rich, if you're poor, if you're educated, if you're uneducated, if you have access to things and you don't have access to things, you're welcome. If you're heterosexual or homosexual, if you don't know, you are welcome. I'm telling you, everybody here is welcome at EC, and I give God praise for that. I can remember this same friend who I was, I was riding bikes with him. I remember one time I was at his house and we were playing tennis and I love to play every sport. I didn't just play the stereotypical sports of basketball and football for a black man. I played everything. Uh, and we were playing and we'd gone back to his house and we had played, we had worked up such a sweat. It was like, man, I, he's like, I'm gonna take a shower. I was like, bro, you know what? I'd love to take one too. He said, man, when I'm done, you can hop on in. I was like, oh, great. Well, uh, he told me later, I come out and, you know, uh, come out of the bathroom. I was getting dressed and uh, he was letting me wear some shorts and a t-shirt or something and his grandma was in the house and he told me he said bro I, I, I don't know what to do. He said my grandma. He said I'm shocked. She just said you're not gonna let that N-word take a shower and use your towels Are you? He was like what? She was like yeah. She said plus she said throw those towels away She said they stain those towels This is the kind of conflict that I've dealt with my entire life. We went to go ride bicycles and we were just riding. It was nighttime, it's great. We lived, uh, I'm from Richmond, Virginia, uh, which is the capital of Virginia. We lived in Henrico County. So it's kind of like Mississauga to Toronto. We went on like a 25, 30 mile bike ride. We're in the city. So it's like if we're in Toronto, just kind of riding, enjoying, it's late, like 10, 10, 30. This was back in the day. Y'all don't know nothing about this. I had headphones on and a CD player. Uh, and my backpack and the CD player had to have the shocks so that the CD wouldn't skip if you go over a bump. Y'all don't know anything about that. Now we just got AirPods and all that. And praise God for that. I'm thankful for that. I have me a pair of old AirPods, but they still work. Uh, and so uh, we're just riding, having a great time. Have my backpack, you know, bottle in there and we're going. And uh, so as we were riding, uh, and kind of uh, just having fun jumping curbs as we're going down the sidewalks and various parking lots. Um, we notice coming uh, the opposite traffic of a, on a one-way street were these two cars. I mean, they were coming like super fast. Uh, and we were like, ooh, they might be drunk or whatever because they're riding opposite the sign, you know, the directional signs. And so we just kind of moseyed on out our way, try to get, you know, make sure that we weren't attracted or involved in anything they had going on. Well. Next thing I know, they turn in this parking lot and they're coming after us, like, like pedal to the metal. And so we were like, whoa, let's, let's ride at the very least. Let's try to get to a well-lit area. We don't know what's happening. We just thought it maybe some kids trying to play a prank on us, but we didn't want to, or beat us up, but we didn't, we didn't want any of that. Well, as we were riding, uh, before I could even, it happened so quickly, man, they're riding, they pull up really close to us. Um, and it's unmarked police cars and it's plain clothes dressed police officers. They don't even stop the car. Uh, while one is, while obviously one is driving, these other police officers get out, they chase us down, throw me off uh, of my bike and, and throw me onto the sidewalk. They're yelling all these different things at me. Uh, elbows, all, I mean, they got like two or three guys pinned me down. They're screaming like, you know, how old are you know, and all this stuff. And they've got me so disoriented. I can't answer, I'm not answering the questions uh, intelligently. Uh, I'm, so, I'm so shocked, I'm so overwhelmed, I'm scared for my life. And I can remember, I'm just like, uh, I'm saying stuff and they're, uh, I didn't even, I didn't, I didn't know my, I'll never forget. They asked me what my name was and I was like, I don't know, I was so scared. I, I thought they were gonna kill me. And while, while all along, they're talking to my friend who was white. They've got him over there, uh, pushed away in the, just, hey, don't worry about that. They're just talking to him. Hey, no, they're trying to block him from seeing. He's like, what are y'all doing? Uh, honestly, when it was all said and done, I remember him coming to me. He was like, um, Akil, I thought they were going to kill you. He said, I, I, I didn't know what, what to do. He said, I thought they were going to maybe plant drugs on you. And there was nothing I was going to do, nothing I could do. They were going to take you away. All of that because I'm a black man. And of course, I fit the description of something taking place. I can remember, uh, just even here recently, I've had so many interactions, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, that uh, Lincoln, we were in the car, 
and uh, he didn't even realize we got a, I got a speeding ticket. I was speeding, <laughs> not terribly fast, uh, and uh, I was just afraid, and I didn't want him to see it, and uh, so I was trying to be, you know, and the cop asked me a question. He said, let me see your registration, uh, and I, I just froze. It's amazing how this fear comes over you. I said, I, I paid cash for the car. Uh, he was like, I didn't ask you how you paid for the car. Again, I, I, nothing rational came out because of the systemic police abuse that I had. I said, I, I just told him, I said, and I was trying not to let Lincoln see I was upset. I said, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we're just a little nervous. I'm a little, I'm, I'm, I'm scared. And uh, <laughs> I reach in to get my registration and I show him. Uh, and this is the stuff that we have to deal with and this is why my heart is heavy <laughs> for our community because I deal with this every day and frankly, it's exhausting and people of color deal with this every day. I can remember, remember being excited when God called me into the ministry um, and having to go get my, my license. Uh, we thought, oh man, this is going to be great. We're super excited. We're getting our ministerial license. Watch out. Uh, my pastor's blessed it. And uh, I was like, he's been behind me. And Sarah and I were just newlyweds. And we're like, here we go. We go. And I'm talking to all my peers who just happened to be white. I wouldn't even think anything of it. Uh, and I thought to myself, man, you know what? They're like, uh, I'm thinking oh, it's going to be long. You're wondering, like, what are they going to ask you? Blah, 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 blah. And so uh, these guys are coming in and out in like five minutes. They're like, bro, high five. It's going to be so good. It's easy. They're going to talk about sports or just talk about what God is doing in your life. You're excited. You're going to get your license. and You're going to go. And so we were like, yes, this is great. So we kind of just like, whoo, took a deep breath. And so we go in and uh, we don't come out till like two hours later. <laughs> and um, you know what? I'll never forget. They're asking us questions. And I was thinking, man. This doesn't seem like, and eventually one of them comes out and just like, he says, hey, you'll never preach in my church. And I don't approve of you getting your license, your ministerial license. And I was like, we were shocked. And he said, he was kind of like, why are you shocked? <laughs> he was like, it's obvious. He said, you're black. He said, and your wife is white. That is, that's a no-go. And then a couple of more men spoke up and said the same thing. We were just devastated. And then a couple of men were like, what? What did you just say? Did you just say they couldn't preach at your church or you're not going to vote for them because he's black? And he, they were like, this is wrong and I don't agree with this. And so it was so awkward. I felt like I had been emotionally raped, I, uh, just humiliated utterly. They had us leave and then later to come back and we got our license by one vote. <laughs> one of those men uh, by the way, just to show you how good God is, we just took the high road where it was that devastated. Yeah, I called my pastor. He was Pastor Buddy Thompson. Y'all know him. He was livid. He was like, I'm coming. You, he's getting him on the phone. He's like, I'm anyway, I'm going to tell you all the stuff that he said. But you know what? God blessed us. We took a different attitude. God helped us. He poured in healing oil. And first, that, that man that said, I never preached at his church. I did preach at his church. He's dead and gone. And I preached. You know what? It ain't his church. It's Jesus' church. <laughs> and I've preached at all those other churches, and God has moved. Jesus does something remarkable when he wants to kind of turn somebody's world upside down. He invites them to a conversation. And so I'm going to invite you to just that, a conversation, where perhaps it will spur on many more conversations and reflection within yourself. Jesus teaches them at the Sermon on the Mount. You all have heard me say this before, uh, but here's what he does. He invites them. We go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came. Now, this is great because he's sitting down. He's approachable. He's inviting them to reason. He's about to turn their world upside down. But before this can happen, he has to invite them to have a seat at the table. And so, you know what I'm going to ask some of you all to do? Some of you all that praise God, and I thank God that we are a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-generational church. For that, I'm just going to give God praise. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. I thank you that we've got all generations. I thank you that we've got all ethnicities. I thank you, oh God, that we've got all cultures here at Extraordinary Church. And this is one of the reasons why I know we're going to continue to impact the world because we are not a mono-ethnic community. Can I tell you, we'll never be a mono-ethnic community unless language is involved. Otherwise, 
We have Africans. We got more Africans. We got South. We got South Americans. We're gonna have more South Americans. You know what? We got. I could go down the list. We got Asians. We got Indians. We got Americans. We got Canadians. Everybody is welcome here at Extraordinary Church. Everybody is welcome to be a part of the conversation of how the gospel revolutionizes our life. Everybody is welcome to experience extraordinary life in Jesus Christ. And if you believe that, you ought to give God praise right where you are. Praise God. So he invites them. And here's where he revisits the law and asks his listeners to do not just what it requires of them, but more. See, Jesus isn't asking us to do just what's required. He's asking us to do more. Not only must one not commit adultery, he says, one should not even entertain the idea and thought by lusting in one's heart. He says, not only should you go where the Roman soldier commands you to go one mile, you should do more. You should go above and beyond because there's no traffic jams when you go the extra mile. God is calling us to go the extra mile. And I will be that pastor that will call out racism as sin. I will call out injustice for what it is. And I will hold ourselves accountable so that we walk in scripture and do what God has called us to do. It is an issue and we are called to shine light in this dark world. Obedience to God requires not only that one act in accordance with God's will, but that one seek in their inmost self to put on the mind of Christ. God, help me to keep my mind on you. Renew my mind with your word. Transform my mind. This charge, this charge to be transformed in thought and attitude does not diminish the duty to seek social justice. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus clearly demonstrates concern for the marginalized and downtrodden. Just read Matthew 25. He enters into a community with those whom society normally considered outcast. The tax collector, the woman of ill repute, the leper, Mary Magdalene, the disciples themselves, they were outcasts. They weren't on the in crowd. They, uh, they, they weren't sitting at people's feet like Paul was at the feet of Gamaliel. These great teachers, nobody wanted anything to do with them. Aren't you thankful when nobody wanted anything to do with you? Jesus Christ came. Can I tell you, it's our responsibility to go to the downtrodden. It's our responsibility to look to the marginalized and say, we have an answer. It's our responsibility to stand up for people who are defenseless. It's our responsibility to visit the widows who have lost their husbands and provide meals. It's our responsibility when people are hurting, say our heart is breaking with you too. Throughout the biblical text, the theme of justice remains a constant presence. Can I tell you, whew, in some contexts, the pursuit of justice may require punishment for misdeeds or an action that remind people of, that remind the people of God of our responsibilities to covenant relationship. In other contexts, the notion of justice may require that the marginalized receive equitable treatment in the community. Whatever the case, it is undeniably clear that God is just and requires justice of his people. See, blessed are the peacemakers. That's what we need today. And let me explain. Peacemakers release tension. Whew. They don't intensify it. Peacemakers seek solutions and find no delight in arguments. Can I just tell you, you know what? We're here to release tension. Be careful what you post on Facebook. Be careful what you post on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok. Why? Because I'm telling you, if you're not releasing tension, you could be intensifying the moment. If you're not seeking solutions, you know what? Can I tell you, you could be finding delight in arguments. I know you have an opinion, but can I tell you, sometimes we can become so disconnected and we no longer seek to understand. We're no longer mourning with those that are just mourning. Can I tell you, some people have, I've seen some people who have posted stuff and people have been bombarding me and calling me this week, crying and weeping and saying, how can someone so be so insensitive? How can I, can I just tell you, now is not a time to be critical. Now is not a time to say, well, we just don't have all the facts he might have done. Can I tell you, now is the time to mourn. Mourn with people of color, mourn with black people specifically. Can I tell you, peacemakers calm the waters. They don't trouble them. Peacemakers, peacemakers work hard to keep an offense from occurring 
And if it has occurred, they strive for resolution. Peacemakers lower their voices rather than raise them. Peacemakers generate more light than heat. Oh, blessed are the peacemakers. Can I tell you, we have enough fighters. We have enough people who are ready to pounce. But when people act, interact with EC, you know what I want them to see? I want them to feel the love of God. I want them to feel the peace of God. I want them to interact with people who are willing to listen. Say, hey, man, I, I don't understand. I might not be a black man or a black woman. Uh, and, you know, and maybe I've experienced a degree of racism. But can I tell you, I just want to hear. I just want to hear what you've had to deal with. I want to listen. Make no mistake, peacemakers. Peacemaking is not a synonym for appeasing. This is not peace at any price. There are limits. Have you heard of the concept of cheap grace? The grace that we enjoy did not come to us cheaply. It cost him his life. And peace is not cheap either. But cheap peace occurs when my brothers and sisters go on living just as, as if Everything is fine and dandy. Even worse, all is well. You might be having peace, but I'm not having peace. Can I tell you, ignoring wrong doesn't simplify life. It complicates it. And when Christ blessed the peacemakers, he was extolling the value of doing all we can to maintain harmony and support unity. His interest was in making peace where peace is an appropriate objective. And what can peacemakers count on? You can be counted on as the sons of God. Praise God. That's what Christ was himself. The Prince of Peace. Praise God. You know what? The Bible says this. I thought about this as I was studying. I want you to think about this for just a moment. I, just, I hope this is okay as I share my heart. Thank you for letting me do so. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For he says, for his name's sake, if you study this in Matthew 5 and the Beatitudes, he said, you know what? When, uh, when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you on my account, he said, blessed are you. Now, I want us to be careful because this is clear. It's for righteousness sake. But then, you know what? I had the thought. I said, this kind of persecution I experience often in and outside of the church. Now, let me just say this. The church is not perfect. Praise God. And I don't have any intention of leaving the church. Extraordinary church will never be a perfect church. You know what? The ark is a type. The ark, like no other ark, it's a type of salvation. You all understand that. There were all kinds of animals and everything on that ark for 40 days, 40 nights. And they were doing their business. In other words, they was letting it all out right there. And just because that place stunk to the high heavens, Noah and his family would have been crazy to leave that place of safety because there was peril outside of that place of safety, the ark of safety. There might be issues in the church, but can I tell you, you be foolish to leave the church. There will be hypocrites in the church, but don't leave the church because of the hypocrites. There will be racism in the church, but don't leave the church because of racism. There will be bigots or passive bigots in the church. Don't leave the church because of passive bigots. There will be gossip in the church, but don't leave the church because of gossipers. There will be liars in the church, but don't leave the church because of liars. I tell you it's safer in the church because God is doing the work his spirit is moving and he's calling us praise God but I thought to myself there's a kind of persecution that I experience as a black man on a daily basis and here's the reality true persecution occurs when two irreconcilable value systems collide and listen in North America it's been entrenched for centuries that black lives have less value than white lives. It's the same with some people of color. And so they cast insults at me and persecute me. <laughs> they pursue us to no end and will even hunt us down. They'll tell all kinds of evil lies about me. <laughs> They'll even assassinate my character. And on certain extreme occasions, they may even attempt to take my life because I'm black. Now, let me just say this. Not every person is racist. Not every white person is racist. Thank God for that. My pastor's white. All my pastors have been white. Not a racist bone in their body. 
My wife is white. My, my wife is white. My mother-in-law is white. They love me. They love our family. I could go down the list. There are a lot of fantastic, amazing white people and just people in general. But I do think sometimes we can do some things that we're unaware of. There's covert racism uh, or there's overt racism and then there's covert racism. Let me give you just an example of covert racism. Overt racism would be burning a cross, wearing a hood, uh, using the N-word. That would be overt racism, which I've heard uh, a, a number of times. Covert racism would be, oh, you, you speak so well as, as if a black man should not be articulate and educated like a white man. I could give you another example of covert racism, access, privilege, uh, and none of those things perhaps might you be responsible for in and of yourself, but we don't realize it. There's varying degrees of racism, and I think sometimes we think, well, just because I don't hate somebody predicated upon the color of their skin, that I might not deal with racism. And so I'm going to invite us to have a little bit of conversation about this. What I love is Jesus included everybody that was rejected. I'm thankful we serve a God who smiles on the disabled, those who can't keep up, those where the deck, the deck is stacked against them, where the world is made nervous by their presence. Can I tell you, this was the case with the disciples. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a theologian that I love to read and peruse his writings, uh, he said this, and I quote, And so the disciples are strangers in the world, unwelcome guests, disturbers of the peace. No wonder the world rejects them. This is exactly how people of color may feel. But aren't you thankful we serve a God who is inclusive? When nobody wanted anything to do with any of us, Jesus came calling. Woo, praise God. When nobody wanted to come to our house, Jesus came to our house. When nobody wanted anything to do with us, he said, come on, come on, come on. I want everything to do with you. And see, if we're not careful, playing the label game can be addictive. I can remember when I would go preach places, people, so one pastor, white pastor said, oh, I hope you preach. He said, I need you to preach. He said, we need a black man to preach. You all know I'm not a hooper. And listen, I love hooping. My bishop, my pastor hoops more than I do. You know? <laughs> And he ain't black. So it's the stereotypes too. We can play the label game and it can be addictive. Can I tell you, judging can become a harsh habit. Judging just based upon what we see with the surface and not seeking to understand. But that doesn't excuse and it certainly doesn't remove the consequences. What is needed most of all is we need to stop. We need to stop. And I'm going to share a few things with you that will help you in this regard. First, here's the first thing we need to do. We need to examine ourselves before we're being, before we're tempted to inspect others. Examine yourself before being tempted to inspect others. In other words, focus on your own areas of weakness and error. For starters, look at your own impatience, laziness, pride, intolerance, greed, lust, ingratitude, anger, careless tongue, indifference, gluttony, pessimism, and worry, only to name a few. Self-examination does wonders when we are tempted to find fault. Second, confess your faults before confronting someone else. I can't explain it, but there's something therapeutic about confessing your weaknesses and your faults. The scripture says, confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. Can I just tell you, you know what it does? You ever done something? You ever apologized for something and you knew you weren't wrong? And you're kind of like, why am I apologizing? I'll tell you why. Because you know what you're doing? You're sending pride to the pit. And humility comes to the surface. And that's the best way to confront someone. Third thing I want to suggest is try to understand the other person's struggle. Try to understand my struggle. Try to understand somebody else's struggle. In this case, with what we're dealing with right now, Try to understand your pastor's struggle as a black man. Try to understand your brother or your sister, your black brother or sister's struggle. Try to understand your brown brother or sister's struggle. Try to understand your white brother or sister's struggle. You know what that does? It makes us more gentle rather than harsh and condemning. And then lastly, remember the goal is restoration. We are here to relieve a person's burdens. 
not add to it. I wish there, I wish we could understand this because when we don't realize it, sometimes in our insensitivity, we make people's pain so much more intense. If I'm being transparent, I've had to take a break from social media until today. I've been, I've been off for a little while just because it's like, okay, the insensitivity so heavy on my heart. I can't, I, I can't, I can't, I can't. But here's what we, need, what we need to know. The greater Toronto area as a community rises and falls together. EC, we rise and we fall together. We are in this together, together, together. We talked about it on Pentecost Sunday, one accord, together, together, together. You know what? I close with this and I get us ready for communion in just a few moments. How beautiful. I want you to think about this. I've always listened to a variety of uh, music. I've always listened to a variety of lyrics. I love every uh, culture, even uh, I love every culture, even when I, um, I listen to every, every ounce of music you can think of. Uh, uh, Keith Green, Twyla Paris, John P. Key, Fred Hammond. I could go down the list. Here's what Twyla Paris wrote with a song called How Beautiful. And these lyrics are powerful. She says, how beautiful the hands that served the wine and the bread and the sons of the earth. How beautiful the feet that walked the long dusty roads into hill and the hills to the cross. How beautiful, how beautiful, how beautiful is the body of Christ. How beautiful the heart that bled, that took all my sin and bore it instead. How beautiful the tender eyes that chose to forgive and never despise. How beautiful, how beautiful. And how beautiful is the body of Christ. And as he laid down his life, we offer this sacrifice that we will live just as he died, willing to pay the price, willing to pay the price. How beautiful the radiant bride who waits for her groom in, with his light in her eyes. How beautiful when humble hearts give the fruit of pure lives so that others may live. How beautiful, how beautiful. You know what we do? How beautiful is the body of Christ when we all come together and we love and we encourage and we minister and we serve one another. How beautiful the feet that bring good news and the love of the King. How beautiful the hands that serve the wine and the bread. We've been called to serve this community, to go out to where it's really dark and to love people, to encourage them, to minister to them. And I want us to pray right now. Can you just say, pray, God, search my heart, search my mind, speak to me, Lord God, reveal to me. I'm acknowledging myself before you, Lord. I'm acknowledging my wrong before you. Examine my heart, God. I want to be inspected, God. I want to look at what's happening in my life. I'm confessing my faults before you, God. I'm repenting. I'm trying to understand. I want to seek to understand somebody else's struggle, God. And help me to remember the goal is restoration. Why, God? Because I believe you're here for such a time as this. You've got me here for such a time as this. I want to be a part of a great move of God, and this is how it will happen. Oh, I give you thanks and I give you praise. Come on and just worship him. Come on and just bless him. In just a few moments, we're going to receive communion, the Lord's Supper, and we're going to begin to see a mighty move of God happen in your rooms right where you are. We bless you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. We are so excited to receive communion. And as you can tell, we're receiving it in our homes. And today, I am at Ashley and Chandra's home. I won't forget Joel and Abigail too. And so, <laughs> yes, we're so excited to be here. And what we're about to do is sacred and special. And the Lord instructs us to do this as often in remembrance of him. And I want you to know that what we're about to do is powerful. I feel the presence of Jesus Christ and I trust and know that you do as well. And before we receive, the Lord's Supper, I want us to just take a moment and repent. The Bible says that we should examine ourselves. 
And it also says that he is near to those who are broken and contrite in their heart and spirit. And so what we just want to do right now is just take a moment and ask God to forgive us, to cleanse us, to wash us, and he will do just that. The Bible says he is faithful and he is just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise God. So why don't we just take a moment right where you are and just, just find a place of repentance. If you want to kneel on the couch or if you just want to lift your hands and worship, but let's together as a family ask God to forgive us and to cleanse us. Lord, I love you and I give you praise. You are so good, Jesus. I'm so thankful, Lord, for your sacrifice. I honor you, Jesus, for there is none like you. You are great and greatly to be praised and you willingly lay down your life for all of us. Lord, I'm so thankful for the sacrifice that you laid, I, for, that you gave. I pray that you would forgive me, God. Search my heart, create in me a clean heart and renew within me a right spirit, God. I would not only want to be right with you, but I want to be right with my brothers and sisters. If I've done anything, Lord, that's been an offense to you, search my heart, search my mind, forgive me. Teach me a better way. Teach me your ways, God, that I might walk in the paths of your righteousness, God. Yes, create in me a clean heart, God, renewing me a right spirit. I desire to be right with you, Lord, for you desire truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part. You have made me to know wisdom, God. I reveal nothing from you. If there's anything that I've done, Lord, forgive me. Yes, Lord, wash me clean, Lord God. And I forgive those who have sinned against me, Lord. I hold no grudge, Lord God. I hold no bitterness. I release them from offense, God. I release them, oh Lord God. As a matter of fact, I bless them in the name of Jesus. And I pray that you would have your way today, God. We honor you and we thank you. And you're so good to us, Jesus. You're so good to us, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Right where you are, can you just worship him? Come on, I feel his presence. Praise God. Yes, God. Hallelujah. Come on, that's it. If you want to lift your hands, if you want to just begin to magnify him, you are worthy, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yes, God, you're so good to us, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. The Lord is so good. The Lord is so good, and I feel his presence. Ooh, so strong. Praise God. The Lord is, he's kind to us. Amen. Amen. He's kind Amen. to us. Praise God. And I'm so excited to do what we're about to do. And I see stuff like that. It just, it melts my heart. Praise God. <laughs> Babies reading that Bible. You know what? Paul wrote to Corinthians or to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. He says, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so what I'd like for you to do, if you haven't already, you've got your cup. I'd like for you to get your cracker or your piece of bread. And Ashley, you may serve your family and then in turn. I know I just read it, but I'm going to read it one more time so that we can receive the Lord's body. First Corinthians chapter 11, it says, verse 24, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may take your bread now or your cracker and you may partake of it. Thank you, Jesus. 
I'm so grateful, Lord. Praise God. You willingly laid down your life, your body. You were bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon you, and by your stripes we are healed, Jesus. I'm so thankful, God. Praise God. Now, in that same chapter as we read, Paul instructs us in the same manner. He also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may take your cup of juice and you may partake. Praise God. Come on, that's it. Let's just worship him. Come on, praise God. Just one drop of blood would have been more than enough. But he gave it all for you and I. Praise God. Come on, that's it. Just one drop of blood would have washed all of us clean. But he willingly laid down his life and let every ounce of blood flow from him. Come on, so that we might be washed and clean. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, we bless you, Jesus. And we thank you, Lord. There is none like you. Hallelujah. Oh, God, you are good. You are worthy of praise. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. His presence is here. Come on, I feel him. Come on, I'm declaring healing and I'm declaring peace. I'm declaring his hope and his victory in the name of Jesus. Oh, his presence is here. Praise God. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. And we give you thanks. There is none like you, God. You are great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. I want you to continue worshiping him. We're going to play a song titled Just One Drop. I want you just to continue to minister to the Lord as you listen to this powerful song in Jesus name. Praise God. Praise God. No. Good. 
hard to believe, but Jesus Christ died on the cross for you. I know it's hard to think about that the King of Kings would give his life. If you just listen to a song that he could have just given a little bit of his blood, but he gave it all, all because he's madly in love with you. And the best response you can have is say, God, I want to give you my life. I'm sorry for everything that I've done, and I want to enter into covenant with you. In the Bible, declares that the way to enter into covenant is for you to go into baptism in Jesus' name. The only name that can save you. The only name that can transform you. The only name that has the power to completely change your life. So we want to invite you. If you want to be baptized in Jesus' name, just go into the church website, extraordinarychurch.ca, call the church office, and we will be glad to put together so that we can baptize you in Jesus' name and you can experience the free gift of forgiveness that only Jesus Christ can give you. And also, I want to invite you to a Zoom call right after this is over. It's going to be popping up here on the screen. It's going to be popping up in the comments. But we want you to come out. If you want to be prayed for, prayed with, or you want to just talk and be heard, we're here for you. Our ministry team is ready to be here for you, do life with you. So come to the Zoom call. You don't have to be in the worst place in your life or the best place in your life. This is for absolutely everybody. And we are looking forward to connecting with you. God's presence, it's in your house, it's in my house. And we are so happy to experience extraordinary life in Jesus Christ.